to. So we still have people joining. Welcome everyone as you're joining. This is our first virtual gathering of the College Readiness Committee um, that is um, staffed and fueled by the, the CVHS PTO. The group I think has been around a while, but last year it really took flight with Gari Simlani at the helm. And she said, you know, at the time, I think she had a junior and she was like, he's not sharing anything. I don't know what's going on in the world of college applications. I know that Maria has been through it at least once and has it coming down her, you know, in her future <laughs> too. So we all sort of got together and said, we need to do this. And um, the videos, um, while I'm thinking of it, um, from last year are all live. And um, I have one slide that Gari was originally going to uh, share, but let me see if I can do it. Um, anyway, but the videos from last year are all live. So if you want to, you know, sort of get started and see the things, the topics that we talked about, we've got so much planned and the things that are in the works for um, this fall and early in the spring semester as well. And so um, just quickly, the, the College Readiness Committee is for parents. So we definitely, I mean, we wouldn't be here doing this if it weren't really to support the kids, um, but we are um, here to indirectly support your children through our support of you so that you have a sense of what's going on, um, what the timeline is, what the 411 is on things like um, test prep, um, financial aid, essay writing, early decision versus early action, all these things that probably make our heads swim a bit. Um, and so we have, let me just quickly get my, we have tentative dates um, set and, and so you can just sort of watch for the emails of the announcements, but tentatively we'll be meeting about every week or two, uh, not in holidays and things like that. Um, and we're gonna have some special guests and people come to talk about different topics over the coming um, months. So if you have any ideas as you're watching them, any ideas for topics, or you want to join the College Readiness Committee, then please reach out to college.readiness at cvhspto.org. Um, and I also want to make sure everyone is aware that I accidentally landed last night when I was prepping for this meeting on the old Vanguardian site like college readiness page. So just really redirect your, you know, we're going to like direct, like groove some new neural pathways on the website because we have a new awesome website um, that's cdhspto.org. And please navigate that direction to go to the college readiness um, resources so that you're getting the most up-to-date stuff, including the older um, videos as well. Um, in the coming weeks, we will have, we're working on a workshop for seniors and then eventually for juniors um, in the spring for essay writing and personal statement writing. Um, presentation, we're going to have some presentations on topics like, like I said a little bit ago, test prep, high school portfolio development, like how do I sort of maximize my time? What classes should I be taking? Um internships, uh, summer programs, things like that, financial aid. Um, and tonight, I'd like to introduce you to Miss um, Galloway, who I see is on here. And she is going to give an overview. We're going to do two primary things tonight. She's going to give an overview with me chiming in and anyone from the com our committee chiming in who is here and wants to participate. Um, on the overall timeline um, and the sort of 411 or like the um, intro to college applications, the kinds of things you do different years, 
the resources that we offer at, um, through the PTO and through um, CVHS, these kinds of juicy nuggets. And um, you have two primary college and guidance counselors. Um, she'll talk a little bit about this, but that are divided by alphabet um, at the school. And then Miss Galloway is on that team and she is a counselor that sort of serves a different role. So, um, and she thankfully does this for us. And also I think DeBakey, she maybe has two or three schools. So um, Ms. Galloway, would you be ready for me to hand it over, hand the baton and you can introduce yourself? Ready, yes, thank you. Very ready, thank you. Thank you for taking your evening. I just, I always, I want, everyone here to know that this is because she's dear and cares because this is not, you know, this is not during the normal work day. So thank you so much for doing this for our parents. Oh, I love you guys. I am excited to be here. I'm glad we're doing this again also. Um, but yes, as they stayed out, well, we'll go to a little bit more, but yes, I am with um, college readiness. Well, now with the whole takeover and stuff like that, our department's kind of changing a little bit, but um, initially it was HISD College Readiness. Um, I do service three high schools this year. So if you were a part of the series last year, I just had Carnegie and DeBakey and they threw a third school on me. So it's okay, we're handling it well, uh, but I do have Carnegie, DeBakey and Heist. And so um, this presentation of well, part one, I, I assume is just gonna kind of be very high level. Um, over the course of the series, we'll go a little bit more like in detail about certain topics within this presentation, but um, I'm hoping just for parents who are on the call, I know college admissions changes a lot. I know when I was in high school, it's a definitely a lot different than it is now. And so I'm just hoping everyone feels a little bit more comfortable about you know how they should be supporting their students and stuff like that. And with that being said, we can just- One quick thing, I'm sorry. I said we were gonna talk about two things. I just need to jump in and say the overview and the other thing I'm reminded by a lovely parent in the chat who asked, um, the other thing is that there's a whole system that the school um, provides that has all kinds of bells and whistles for helping track and navigate and assist the process. And um, HISD changed systems from something called Naviance to something called, I think, Student Links. And so that's the second primary goal tonight is that once Ms. Galloway has had a chance to go through this overview, that she can give a quick overview of what that system offers. And um, and then we can tell you how to gain access to that. So um, sorry to interrupt. I just didn't no, want to it's fine. Uh, yes, I will be doing kind of like a, I'll share my screen at the end of this presentation and I'll show you guys what the new platform looks like. It's called School Links. And so we're all kind of getting used to it. Uh, but essentially, whenever your students become seniors, that is how the counselors will be sending the documents that the colleges need. So like transcripts, um, counselor recommendations, teacher recommendations and stuff like that. Uh, but yes, we will. I'll do that kind of like at the end. So you guys know like what that looks like. Um, and so I guess without further ado, we can get started. Uh, this is actually my second year at Carnegie. And so I will say, even though I love all my other campuses, um, I really do feel welcome that you guys' campus, everyone's just super nice. And it really truly does feel like a family. I don't know if it's because most of the people who've been at Carnegie have been there for some time, but it really truly does feel like a family and everyone's kind of, you know, embraced me. So I do appreciate that. Um, and so we can move forward to the next slide. Yeah, yeah, so session overview. So the whole purpose of this uh, presentation is to kind of give like a brief timeline and overview uh, for understanding the college admissions process uh, for parents and essentially for students too. Um, I This is the same presentation that I give to students. However, I tweaked it a lot uh, just to kind of go like a little bit more in depth for you all. Um, so that's the whole purpose. Um, also this year I created a link tree. It's super helpful to kind of disperse information across all campuses. I took some time today and I up, uh, updated it. And so it should be set to load tomorrow. So if you guys would like access to the link tree or if you, you can scan that QR code and you can also um, subscribe to it, I think. So anytime I do make edits, you guys will get an email saying that there's been new things added to the link tree. And so it's really just general information. If there's time at the end, I'll show you guys what that looks like too. But if you're familiar with Linktree, essentially all it is, is just a bunch of different links that will take you to things. But it's very broad, very comprehensive. And so I think it's helped the seniors a lot this year as well, as well as the juniors. 
And so the next slide, and so the team that is at Carnegie, uh, we have our two lovely counselors, Mr. Frau and Ms. Chapman. Um, if, if your student has the last name between A through L, then they do have Mr. Frau. And if they have the last name M through Z, then they have Ms. Chapman. Um, they've been one of Ms. Chapman has been there for some time. Um, and so, you know, I've learned a lot from her over the course of the year and going into this year. Um, the counselors help, they are very hands-on with the college application process. I will say compared to other HISD high schools, um, the role looks, my role looks different at every single high school, but I will say that the counselors are super, super, super hands-on. Uh, once your students become seniors, they make sure they meet with every single senior in their alpha split to ensure that they're on track with the college application process. And um, the where I come in is I kind of come in, I help support. Oftentimes students kind of need someone to bounce ideas off of. And so that's kind of where I come in, um, scholarship opportunities, stuff like that. Also, when the students go to the counselor suite, they'll see um, two other individuals in there. They'll see Ms. Gidry, who is the um, clerk. And so she kind of helps assist the counselors. She also does, um, she takes their volunteer hours and then we have Ms. Maxie, who's the registrar. I do believe Ms. Maxie is part-time, so she's not on campus every day, but any concerns you might have about your student's transcript, uh, Ms. Maxie is there to kind of help um, service that. And so in addition to that team, on the next slide, um, then that's where I come in. Like I uh, mentioned, I do have three campuses, so Carnegie, DeBakey, and Heiss. Um, last year, I was on campus Mondays and Wednesdays. This year um, is for sure Wednesdays because they have long advos. That's when I can meet with students, have open labs and stuff like that. Um, and so we're kind of been alternating days, but I do have two other campuses this year. Um, again, I just assist the students with college applications. Um, personal statements have been like a big one of the, these past three weeks. So just reading them with students, kind of giving like feedback, any kind of recommendations. Um, the, they're... Ms. Casperson, who I believe is AP Psych and English, and then Mr. Parker, I think who's AP uh, English Lit, they've been super um, helpful with assigning it, not only for an assignment, but also yeah. all three of us have been instrumental in just reading over their personal statements and giving feedback and stuff like that. Um, also, I meet with students, we kind of look at their academic profile, so their GPA and their test scores to kind of build a college list for them. Um, and then we are, we're also in the thicket of sending out tons of scholarship opportunities. Mm -hmm. So the students are a little overwhelmed, but they're going to be very overwhelmed next semester because that's when those opportunities become a little bit more prevalent. And then financial aid, we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, but we can go to the next slide. And so just kind of like an agenda or a run of show, we're just we're gonna talk about a few things and we're gonna talk about essentially students doing their research. I'm gonna talk about what that looks like for each grade level. And um, we're also gonna talk about the different platforms that students will use, not only to apply for college, but also we're gonna go into School Links too, which is the platform for the district this year. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about applying to highly selective schools and what that looks like because it, most of the students at Carnegie will be applying to those highly selective schools, Rice, Carnegie Mellon, Harvard. And so why that process looks different from your typical in-state four-year institution. And then also I'm gonna go over like a senior year timeline and um, what they should be working on working up until um, their senior year. And so ninth grade, so if you have a freshman that's at Carnegie, um, I'm hoping that they're handling things well because we do know Carnegie can be, be very rigorous academically. And so we try not to put a lot of pressure on the ninth graders. While we do want them to kind of be thinking about college, what it is they want to uh, major in or career, we do kind of heavily emphasize to them that, you know, ninth grade, you really should be focusing on just doing well academically. Um, and also, um, being involved. So joining clubs, extracurriculars. The reason why we really stress um, for them to perform well academically is because when they apply to colleges as seniors and their transcript gets sent to these colleges, all the colleges see is ninth, 10th, and 11th grade year. So it's super, super important that, you know, ninth grade year, they're kind of like lasered in and they're doing well um, in their classes and they set the tone for, you know, the next years to come. Um, also, we encourage them to attend college fairs. Um, I know that, excuse me, um, a lot of colleges will do regional visits, but also we do have a lot of colleges that come to Carnegie throughout the school year. And so unfortunately, we don't really have um, a lot of college fairs at Carnegie just because of the space, parking situation, stuff like that. 
But I think so far this academic school year, I think we have like 75 colleges come to Carnegie. And so those are usually held during advocacy, lunch. Yeah, lunch and advocacy. Those are typically when those are um, held. Um, also, we encourage ninth graders to prepare for the PSAT. And also starting in 2024, it will be entirely online. And so we're telling um, all students actually that they need to have blue book installed on their computer um, they'll be working on that in their advos but it's just really important that you know the most important thing is just to do well academically because that's going to set the tone for your transcript essentially and so they want to go into their sophomore year and their junior year with a with a really good um, gpa uh, we also encourage the ninth graders in the summertime maybe to be a part of some summer bridge programs um, and so earlier this week, or maybe it was last week, I did send out to the ninth graders, um, there's a summer bridge opportunity with UT Austin. If students are interested in computer science, they usually have those every summer. So I did send that out and I believe it's due in at the end of December, like right before Christmas. And so with ninth graders, again, we don't wanna put too much pressure on them. Like we don't want them to feel as if they have to know what it is they wanna major in or right now because of course, they're still going to go through the rest of their high school career, but the really, really big thing is at least to just maintain your grades for the most part. Uh, that's for the ninth graders. And so moving on to the 10th graders, it's going to be a little bit of the same. Again, just maintaining their grades, prepping for the PSAT, um, because I believe 10th going into 11th or is during their 11th grade year, they could qualify for um, national merit. And so that kind of opens up doors for scholarship opportunities at various colleges. And uh, one way that the students can prepare for the PSAT and the SAT is using Khan Academy. Um, the district really pushes that. Khan Academy is also um, an extension of College Board. And so of course, College Board, SAT, we highly encourage students to use Khan Academy. Um, the cool thing about Khan Academy is there's been research that shows that students who spend a consistent amount of time on Khan Academy, so whether that's three days a week, maybe 30 minutes um, out of those three days, they can consistently improve their score by maybe like 30 points. Also, whenever they do Khan Academy, they kind of do like in a practice exam. And so based on the results from the practice exam, it will tell the student, hey, you did really well in these areas, but you didn't do so well in these areas. And so it'll put together a study plan for them to improve on the areas that they didn't do well in. And so we really, 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 really push Khan Academy. Um, also, we uh, Revolutionary Prep, um, they send out a lot of really good opportunities to us as well. Um, the opportunities are free and if students would like additional support, they do cost. And so if, if there are any parents who might be interested in Revolutionary Prep, the uh, rep has actually been wanting to talk to parents <laughs> for a really long time. So I'll get with you guys, see if that's something you guys may be interested in, but um, really just prepping for like the PSAT for the most part. Um, also joining clubs and extracurriculars. Um, when they're doing college applications or senior year, they will notice that some colleges will be doing something called a holistic review. We'll talk about that in one of the later slides, but it's just really important that students are well-rounded. So not only can they perform well academically, but they're also involved in various clubs, organizations, et cetera. I also want to dispel a myth that there are a lot of students who are like, oh, I'm, try I'm involved in like 10 clubs because it'll look good on college applications. And so I want to say, you know, it is good that you're involved, but also don't involve your over involve yourself for the sake of college applications. It looks to colleges, it looks a little better that you've been involved in maybe like three clubs over the course of your entire high school career. So ninth, tenth, eleventh grade, twelfth year, because it's something you're passionate in, you're passionate about as opposed to being involved in like ten different clubs and kind of like all over the place, if that makes sense. So we definitely want can to I, can I involved. jump in on that? Yes, Ms. Galloway. Mm -hmm. So depth, genuine interest, um, these things matter so much more than stacking a resume. And we can see straight through that when we're interviewing students for schools and when the um, admission directors and folks are um, reviewing applications. So when you're a freshman or a sophomore, you may not know what you want to go into depth for. And like Ms. Galloway was saying, that's a great time to explore and try some different things and, and sort of see where your interests lie, do a little experimentation. And then if possible, start, you know, I think a lot of times this happens quite naturally, but you start to land on the things that have some general actual meaning and resonance. And, um, I think folks would so much rather hear someone talk about, I joke about like my 
a pickle making business where they grow the herbs and make the pickles and they are genuinely passionate about it and they've learned about business through that and selling their pickles or whatnot than seeing something that has 15 clubs on there that they don't really have any genuine interest um, or depth of involvement with. So thank you for letting me jump in. Oh, no, no, thank you for that sentiment too. Um, because I hear it all the time. They're like, oh, well, I'm involved in this or, you know, they're like, well, I've done all of this. Which ones do you think rank more and stuff like that? And so it's really important that they're involved in things. They don't necessarily have to be uh, career related while that's great too. But we know there are students, I think there's a club called D&D Dungeons and Dragons and it's kind of like a fantasy thing, but it's good to know that like, you know, outside of being a student, you know, you're a human being too. So it's just really important that students understand that like, they need to be genuinely in involved in things that they're passionate about, as opposed to like, okay, I need to do this for the sake of college applications. Um, also, it's not on here, but summer bridge programs definitely want to repeat that here for 10th grade. Um, the summer of their 10th grade year going into 11th grade year, if there are any opportunities for them to do summer bridge opportunities, we definitely encourage it. I know some of them can be kind of like um, expensive, uh, but we typically do send out a lot of opportunities in the spring for these students. And so definitely some summer bridge opportunities as well. And then moving on to the juniors, the juniors are getting a little antsy uh, this school year, which is fine. We're glad that they're kind of like excited, but a uh, junior year, definitely prepping um, for the SAT. Um, I also believe typically uh, they did it differently this year, but I do believe in the fall semester of the junior year, um, typically, ideally, they do take the PSAT, but I also I think it's in March, too. Like I said, they've been doing it differently this year, but it's important. A lot of students don't take the PSAT seriously because they're like, oh, it doesn't matter. It's not the real thing, but they can, it can qualify them for national merit, which, again, opens the doors uh, for a lot of um, scholarship opportunities as well. And I'm sorry, we can go to the next slide. Um, and then it's also really good, again, that they continue to maintain their grades because, again, 12th grade year, 9th, 10th, and 11th grade, when they're applying to colleges, that's what they see on their transcripts. And so we often have some students who their 11th grade year, they're like, hey, I didn't do so well 9th and 10th grade year. However, if I get all A's this semester and I get a 4.0, that'll boost my GPA, right? And it's like, eh. Not quite because you have the, again, the GPA is weighted. So you have the weight of ninth grade and 10th grade year. And so solely just doing well one year won't necessarily boost your GPA that much. So it's really good that they're taking their academics seriously across all three um, school years. Um, also, it's really important that they are building a preliminary college list. And so with the juniors, we did have a, um, a junior forum back in September where we went into all of their Advo classes and we kind of started talking about the college application process, things they should start thinking about. And so it's really important that they start thinking about what, for one, what they want to major in, and then two, what kind of colleges they have a, a shot of, at applying to. Um, but we usually, we start right now, we're working super heavy with the seniors because they're getting ready to exit. Yesterday was November 1st. That was a really stressful day because students are trying to get a lot of their college apps in, early decision and stuff like that. But we will for sure hit the ground running with the juniors. So um, there have been a lot of juniors who reached out to me already wanting to sit down and talk. And I typically do meet with them and we just kind of like brainstorm and kind of get some ideas on paper. But uh, ideally 11th grade year, again, it really just boils down to grades. They should already be involved in extracurriculars. They need to start building their resume. And I'll kind of show you guys how they can start tracking that in school links. Um, and then also summer bridge programs as well um, during that summer. And so moving on to the next slide, um, it's really important that students do their research, um, but it's also important that they understand their academic profile. And so um, I usually tell students that their GPA and their test scores has a huge impact on the kinds of schools that they can apply to. So ideally, um, the higher the GPA, the higher the test score, the more options you have. Honestly, kind of like free reign. Um, and I'm sorry, excuse the naviance, but um, School Links does have a scattergrams feature. I'll show you guys what that looks like. But um, also the lower the GPA and the lower the test score, the more limited that we have to work with. Um, also, we definitely want to talk about best fit, best match. So we have students who are, we have students who are applying to 20 schools intentionally. And then we have students who are applying to 20 schools, like just kind of like for the heck of it, right? And so it's really important that students ensure that the colleges they're applying to, for one, even have their major. So for example, 
a, a small liberal arts school, depending on the school, may not have like a lot of those STEM majors that you might be interested in. And then um, also want to make sure that, for example, I'll use UH, for example, um, certain majors at the University of Houston have additional requirements on top of the requirements to get into the institution. So those are mainly going to be like your comp sci majors, engineering, nursing. So while there are admissions requirements to get into the institution, to actually snatch snatch those majors or additional requirements on top of that. So we had a lot of seniors last year who applied to UH and they're like, yeah, like I got into UH, but I got my third choice major. That's not really what I wanted. And so just be mindful that some of these schools, UH, for example, is a tier one institution. They're starting to become a little bit more picky and selective about the students, not only that they're like letting in, but that they're giving the majors too. And so also just making sure students understand the cost of tuition. Like a lot of students are applying to Trinity. They don't know Trinity is like a 50, $60,000 a year institution. So just being mindful of cost and then also just understanding public and private. And with that being said, private institutions can be a little bit more expensive um, than public as well as being in and out of state. Um, and then we can move on to the next slide. And so again, it's just really important that students do their research. I usually tell students there is no one size fits all approach for these institutions. Every institution runs differently. Every institution has their own requirements. And so sometimes they're answering really um, specific questions and I tell them, you know, hey, like I'm not a walking like Google encyclopedia. You really do have to go on the website and like do your research thoroughly because each college is going to be um, different. And then um, next slide. Oh, and so building your college list, I'm sure students are tired of hearing this, but it really is something to live by. So safety target reach. And so I typically encourage students to apply to their safety schools first, um, especially if it's a school you know you're going to get into, especially top 10%. I used to tell our top 10% students, um, go ahead and start knocking out those in-state schools that we already know you're going to be accepted. So you already have that, you know, solidified. That gives you more time to work on those reach schools or those dream schools is what we call them. Um, and if you're top 6%, then it's UT. UT has to be the exception, right? Um, and we usually tell students your safety schools. I mean, ideally you should have maybe one to three safety schools, um, ideally, but some students, it kind of varies depending on their academic profile, what options they have. Um, target, a target school is kind of like a 50-50 prospect. Um, you may be on target with it, but it kind of varies uh, depending on their admissions process. And then REACH schools, these are like your dream schools. These are schools that are also highly selective and they have a low acceptance rate. And these are the schools that are telling students to be your true authentic self, as in like there is no secret sauce. There is no formula to get into this school. It's really I don't want to say it's left up to chance, but the student really does have to put forth has the student really has to put their best foot forward when they're submitting this application, meaning their personal statement needs to be on point. Their supplementals have to be well, there has, there has to be thought put into them. With your REACH school, students cannot just kind of like just do stuff and submit it. They really do have to be thorough with these applications because they're highly selective for a reason. And so a student could be number two in the class. They could have a 4.9 GPA. They could have a perfect score on the SAT, but that does not necessarily mean that they're getting into rice, right? Because there's another student who's in Iowa who has a 4.9 GPA and they have a perfect score on the SAT. So it really is important for students to kind of figure out what sets themselves apart. And we'll talk about that in another slide, but um, building their college list, students ideally should follow the safety target reach model. And so we often have students who are applying to like 20 schools and like maybe 17 of them are reach and we have no safeties. And so we just wanna make sure that students have a very, very balanced um, college list. And so um, next slide. And so the platforms that students will be using, um, Coalition, we don't really get too many students using Coalition, so I didn't add it on here, but for the most part, our students use these two. Um, and so we have students who are like, you know what, Ms. Galloway, I'm not going out of state, I'm staying in Texas. And so we use, we encourage them to just go ahead and use Apply Texas. That's if you plan to stay in state. Um, and then most majority of our students are gonna be using Common App. Um, Common App is for pretty much only, I would say not a lot of Texas schools use Common App, but they're starting to come around to it. But students who are kind of open to going out of state, uh, most of your highly selective private schools are going to be using Common App. So and that's what most of our students use. Um, I'll talk about School Links in a second, but School Links is integrated with Common App. They talk 
Um, and so you'll see this one used the most. Ooh, deadlines. <laughs> um, these are common app deadlines specifically. And so uh, I think I'm going to start with early decision, which is kind of on the right. Number two, um, we were dealing with this yesterday because, again, it's November 1st. Um, so early decision, we usually say ED. So like, hey, are you going to ED anywhere? Um, all early decision is binding. And so this means, hey, if I'm going to, if I'm going to apply early decision to Rice, and I get into Rice, I am going to Rice. And so we tell students, you know, don't early decision to a school and you're kind of like iffy about whether you want to go or not. Early decision is really all in and it's, very, and it's binding, meaning that um, a, a contract has to be signed by the counselors, the student, and then in most cases, the parent as well. And so I usually tell students, you know, if you are going to early decision to a school, it's really important that, you know, you sit down with your parent and you do the net price calculator. Um, all the net price calculator, um, you sit down with a the parent, they're going to ask some information, mainly about income. You guys put those numbers in, it's going to spit a number out at you guys. And so that number is what the, the college is going to be expecting you to contribute. And so we usually tell students, you know, sit down with your parent. If your parent is like, you know what, this is something we can do then I think it would be a good idea for you to early decision. If you sit down with your parent and like, ooh, like, I don't know about that, then maybe you should instead apply early action. And so just be mindful, early decision, you can only apply to one school early decision. If you are accepted to that institution, it's, it's basically saying that you are going to go and you have to withdraw all your other applications because you're going to enroll at the institution. And so moving to early action, which is open count number one, all early action means is you apply early, get a decision code. And so most applications are early are early action. I usually tell students, you can apply to as many early action schools as you would like. Um, I typically encourage it because you kind of have more time to compare offers as the acceptances come in. Um, but early action, apply early, get a decision early, and it's EA. And again, you can apply to as many schools early action as you would like. Um, moving oh, although may I just interrupt our, um, not all schools. I mean, I, I think there is a little bit of a bifurcation between the Texas schools and early action, like, like not all private institutions offer early action. Some do some offer, some don't mm -hmm. offer early decisions. So just make sure when you're doing your research that you are clear on what the different choices are. Um, early decision is it does help your odds. Um, so you have to weigh that against your willingness to commit to that school wholeheartedly. Yeah, it, it does help because it lets it lets the colleges know like, oh, like, you know, they're really invested to this school. And if we admit them, then they're going to come. So early decision does help uh, students. I just, we always have a couple of students every year who are like, oh, like I wasn't expecting to have to contribute this much. And so we just tell them, make sure you do your research. Uh, but if everything checks out, then we're for it. Like, please go ahead and do it. Uh, but yes, as you mentioned, not all schools have an early decision. Not all schools have an early action. And I think on the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about like Texas schools and like their deadlines. Um, regular decision is just like regular decision. And it's also kind of like the last opportunity you have to apply to a school, but those deadlines fall a little later. So January and February. Um, also, just be mindful if you apply a regular decision to a school. If you're applying in January, you probably won't know anything until maybe like, depending on how fast they process applications, it could be March, April. And so we're nearing the end of the school year at that point. Um, and so just be mindful of a regular decision, but you do have a little bit more time to work on those applications. Um, and then moving to rolling admissions, all this means is that as applications come in and students are sending their documents, that they're making decisions. So for example, Texas A&M is a rolling admissions school. And so um, even though they have a final deadline of December the 1st, if you, were apply, if you apply to Texas A&M, I don't know, in September, you got all your information into them on time, your application is marked as complete, they will start processing your application and they'll roll out a decision as they process it. That's all rolling admissions means. And then on the next slide, I believe we talk about the Texas uh, deadlines and uh, oh, restrictive early action. How could I forget? Restrictive early action. This is gonna be like your, your Harvard, your Yale. I think Stanford is um, restrictive early action as well. Um, it's not binding. However, if you are applying to any of these schools, um, you cannot apply to any other schools. You have to wait 
until you hear back from these schools before you can put in any of your early uh, your other ones. So not a lot of schools do restrictive early action, but it's definitely like Yale, uh, like I said, Harvard, those are the restrictive early action schools. Um, and so just be mindful, if you are applying to those schools, you can't do, apply to any other schools and you're just gonna have to wait until you hear back from them before you can put other apps in. A few of the schools have a second early decision <laughs> window. That's a newer thing, I think, or it's newer to me, but I know Vanderbilt does. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head where it's it's binding, and but the deadline is like a little, you know, you could theoretically hear back on one early decision and then quick put that other one in and then um, you would be bound to that school, but it gives you like maybe a second choice for some of those scenarios. So it may just be worth doing some research on that um, if you're a, a junior or senior. I think Boston has an ED2 as well. Um, but yeah, that is a little newer um, and the, the it is a little later. Uh, what's the difference between restriction and so restrictive early action, only a few schools use that. The only difference between the two, so with early decision, you can apply to, you, you can only do one school early decision, but you can still put applications in to other schools. With restrictive early action, you can just apply to that one restrictive early action school and you can't apply anywhere else. You have to wait until you hear back from that school before you can put in other apps. I hope that kind of like makes sense. Um, and then with these deadlines, these are mainly like our five Texas deadlines. I kind of, I sent out an email to the students so they would understand what these mean. So with priority deadline, it's very similar to early action, meaning you apply early, you get a decision early. And so we like to call, we call these schools the big three, right? And so the big three consists of UH, UT Austin, and Texas a and And so when we're talking about the University of Houston, uh, their priority deadline is November 1st. And so if you apply to the universe, if you apply to the University of Houston by November 1st, that's to be eligible for some institutional scholarships that they have. So for example, one of them is called the Academic Excellence Scholarship. And so if you would like to be considered for that Academic Excellence Scholarship, their priority deadline is November 1st. And so that's why a lot of seniors yesterday were trying to hurry up and get their apps in because they would they want to be considered for that scholarship. Now, if students don't hit that November 1st deadline, they have until June 2024 to apply to UH. So, um, but priority deadline for UT Austin, again, very similar to early action, apply early, get decision early. So UT Austin has two deadlines. Their uh, priority deadline is November 1st. If you apply to UT Austin by November 1st, you will be notified of a decision by February 1st. But if students don't hit that November 1st deadline, it's okay because they have until December 1st to apply to UT Austin and then they will be notified of a decision by March 1st. So that's what it means for UT Austin. Um, Texas A&M does have a priority deadline. It's specifically for students who are wanting to go into engineering and that deadline is October 15th. But students do have until uh, December 1st to apply to Texas A&M. So priority deadline kind of means something different for a lot of Texas schools. But specifically, that's what it means um, for these institutions here. And then regular deadline, again, very similar to regular decision. This is kind of like the last opportunity you have to apply to the school. Um, and so UT Austin, Texas A&M, their regular deadline is December 1st. So that's all that kind of means. And if a student is in the top 6% or 10%, depending on which school we're talking about, would they be told that at the beginning of when would they find that out so that they sort of know how to factor yeah, that into their process? I know Texas, Texas A&M has already been, if the student has already applied, they've already submitted their transcript, Texas A&M is already notifying students like if they're top 10%. Um, UT Austin, I wanna say, I think last year, if students were top, remember for UT Austin, you have to be top 6%. I think they were notifying students once their applications were complete. So I don't think UT Austin was waiting until February 1st or you know March 1st to roll those decisions out. Um, but again, they were top 6% and they were automatically admitted. They're really just waiting on the transcript to verify that they are indeed um, top 6% to be automatically admitted. Okay, and the transcript from Carnegie is what confirms that for mm -hmm. the school. Yeah. Um, because I know a lot of times this, I'm imagining some parents are wondering like, you know, sort of what's the drop, what's the over under date that sort of by which that gets determined? Is it the spring 
grades of junior year? Yeah, so the transcripts that get sent to the colleges is their senior year. So their seniors, when the transcripts get sent, the only thing that colleges will see is ninth, 10th, and 11th grade year. And so that's why we really tell them like, hey, like you really need to continue strong like your junior year and all the other grades before that. But I'm glad you mentioned scholar uh, transcripts because Carnegie is technically a non-ranking school. And so, which actually works out to the student's benefit. Um, the only students that will have a rank on their transcript are top 10% uh, for this rule. Uh, because if you think about it, there could be a student at Carnegie who has a 4.7 um, GPA and they're not top 10%, but they could be ranked. I think this year we have 199 seniors. So let's say for example, this student has a 4.7 GPA and they're like number 75, right? So like, if you think about it, that's still a really great GPA, but for that, those purposes, that's why those students who are, are outside of the top 10% will not have a rank on their transcript for that reason, so. Thank um, you for clarifying that. Of course. Thank you for mentioning it. <laughs> and so on the next slide, I think um, it's talking about applying to highly selective schools. Um, with the highly selective schools, okay, like these are your Columbia, um, you know, your Carnegie Mellon, your Stanford. Um, also, it is your, you know, your Yale. These are schools typically with um, low acceptance rates. Um, they're also schools that are getting thousands of applications because they're prestigious, right? Um, and so essentially a lot of students, and I'm sure parents are wanting to know like, okay, like what's the formula? Like, what does my student need to do to get into these schools? Like, what's the secret? Like, what do we need to be doing, right? <laughs> and so as Ms. Chapman says, like, there is no formula, there's no secret sauce. Uh, it's essentially just ensuring that you put forth the best application possible. But at the same time, we want students to be their true authentic self, which I think is on the next slide. Um, so it's really important. And oftentimes we have students who are like, I had a student, it wasn't at Carnegie, it was at another school. I had a student tell me like, hey, like I'm really struggling writing my personal statement, but like nothing like bad or traumatic has happened to me. And I'm just like, nothing bad or traumatic has to happen to you for you to, you know, to get into these schools, right? And I think it's because, you know, we see movies and stuff like that where people have like this sob story, but that's not necessarily the case. They really do want you to be genuine. And they want you to stand out. Um, and so I want to say in the spring, um, it was Columbia, UT, U Michigan, and it, uh, Yale, and it was another highly selective school. They did a regional visit to Houston, and I guarantee you every single person when they came, they said the same exact thing. We want you to be your true authentic self, right? And so students hate hearing that because they're like, what do you mean? Like, how do I do that? And so it really is important. And we'll, we work with the juniors on like bringing this out in their personal statements. But um, I've read some brilliant personal statements from students. And so I think the thing is students want to hear like, well, I don't think this is important to admissions. And I'm like, well, it's not necessarily a matter of them caring or not. You have to make them care, right? And so there's oftentimes where I'm reading personal statements. So I'm like, oh, wow, like, even though it's kind of like, it seems like a simple topic, the way they wrote about it is impactful, if that makes sense. So it's really important that students be genuine, they stand out. I had a student write a personal statement about uh, Dungeons and Dragons. It's some kind of game that I'm not too familiar with, but the way that they wrote it and the way that they told their story was phenomenal. I'm like, okay, well, what, what is it about this game? I wanna know a little bit more, right? And so I usually tell students, don't come into it thinking that, you know, that they have to care about it. It's your job to make me care about it, you know, be very evoking and stuff like that. And so I tell students that when they're applying to these schools, they're going to get a lot of, um, these schools are going to get a lot of applications from top performing students, but it's your, it's, this is your opportunity to stand out. So what's different about you, right? So again, it's like I said, it's, it's cool that you got that 1600 on the SAT, you have a 4.9 GPA, but there's there's a couple other students in the country who have that same academic profile. So how are you going to stand out? How are you going to tell your story? What's going to be different about you, essentially? And so I think on the next slide, I think it shows um, some of the prompts that the seniors are going to be. Oh, so this is taken directly from um, Common App, but this is the personal statement section. And so the students do have to write clearly, concisely, and they need to write in their own voice. And they have 650 words. Um, there are some colleges that have a smaller word limit, but um, I usually tell students in your personal statement, you don't necessarily want to repeat things that are in um, 
your resume, you know, and stuff like that. You definitely want to talk about something while it's cool to focus on maybe one or two things, but don't just repeat to me your application, right? I want to know what kind of student you are outside of this. And so that's kind of where students struggle a little bit, but after a while they get it out and they come out to be like phenomenal personal statements. Um, and then I think on the next slide. Miss Galloway, just for um, understanding and differentiating. So the personal statement, is it fair to say that is basically goes to all the schools that would be on, that you would be sending through the common app. And then the, the, the different schools would say, we want you to fill out X, certain questions from the essay prompts also and then some may have additional supplemental yes good questions question. mm -hmm. yeah so common app has seven prompts that students can write on um and so some colleges may say like hey you can choose a prompt any prompt we just want you to submit one but there are some colleges who may be like, no, we want you to specifically write on this prompt. And so your personal statement is essentially your college essay. We use the terms, you know, very synonym synonymously. But also on top of your personal statement, some schools may have supplemental questions. And these are essentially just short response questions. Um, and so I know UT has like three or four of them. So not only do you have your personal statement in your essay, but on top of that, UT wants you to write three or four short answer questions and maybe like, I think it's 250 or 300 words or less. And so that's why we really tell the juniors in the summer, like, hey, college apps open on, on August 1st, but I've never really seen the prompts change too much. And so that's why we tell the juniors like, hey, maybe like in the spring going into the summer, it's a good idea to start, you know, brainstorming your personal statement because We'll have a couple of students every year, apps are due November 1st, and it's like October 28th, and they're trying to get all that writing in, right? So that most of the time, they can tell when it's rushed. When I'm reading them, I can tell that they're rushed. And so it's really important that they spend the summertime, even the end of their junior year, just brainstorming. Because I tell students all the time, when I was applying in grad school, I think I gave myself two or three months to write my personal statement. And I'm glad I did, because boy, was it an evolution. And so it's really important that, you know, this is not something they can just do overnight or like a couple days before, especially if it's a school they really, really, really want to um, go to. So just be mindful that these highly selective schools, they're not easy to get in for a reason. And so it's really important that students submit a quality, well thought out application. Um, I think the next slide, the next slide may have the prompts. Um, it does. Um, if anyone would like access to the presentation, let me know because anything that's underlined is actually clickable and it'll take you there. But again, there are seven prompts. And so kind of what I talked about already, um, they will take you there. Um, they will let you know which one they want you to write on specifically. Um, and then moving on to the next slide. Did, did we say, I don't, did, does everyone know what the Common App is? I mean, because I'll just say my generation, I think I'm older than you, Ms. Galloway. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> um, I, we didn't, like, I went to Northwestern University undergrad, as an undergrad, and, like, that what they didn't accept it back then, but now they absolutely do. And so do you want to just speak for a minute or so on that? Common App, Common App is essentially this platform where students will be completing their college applications and submitting them. So Common App is essentially kind of like this hub that houses all these college applications for all of these schools. Um, and that's where they will apply to the colleges. The same thing with Apply Texas. Apply Texas is mainly for, again, Texas schools. Common App is pretty much all everywhere else. Like some Texas schools use it. They're coming around to Common App. Every year, a few more Texas schools decide to use it. But Common App is essentially the, the hub, I guess, or the platform where students will go in and start doing their college applications. And I usually encourage students, like if you ever, if you're like really, really, really pressed to kind of like start the college application process. Now, of course you cannot apply until August 1st of your senior year, but, you know, there are some students, I usually tell students, like, if you want to know what kind of questions they're asking, you know, just create a Common App account, you know, choose a school, go in and click through the questions just to kind of see, like, what they may be asking you. But essentially, it's kind of, um, it's a hub where the college, where you'll apply to the college and they'll receive all of your information for your application, if that makes sense. And I think it's like up to 20 schools, I think, that you can select. I think that's what on I the Common App... I think they upped it. Did they up it? 
Oh, no, I'm thinking of FAFSA. I'm sorry, FAFSA. I'm thinking of, of FAFSA. Uh, but yeah, it's it's. I think it is like up to twenty schools. And then with Texas, like she said, there's an Apply Texas app that, or you know, system, and and there's something like that for the UC, the University of California system. So you actually would do like one application for a lot of those schools. So um, just that's part of the research. Is I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah. So UC is similar to Texas. They have the UC system. Um, so you probably you won't see many of those in Common App. And then Cal State has their own like a uh, platform as well. Um, pro tips. These are geared mainly towards juniors and seniors, but it's really important that they create an intentional and balanced list. Um, one thing when students request advising sessions, I'm looking at your college list. I'm like, hey, I don't see enough safety schools on here. Like I, it could just give me two, two or three max, but I see too many reach schools on here. And so although students are very well capable of getting into highly selective schools, it really, I don't want to say it's a raffle because it's not, but it is a very competitive process. And so we just want to make sure students at least have the safeties, right? Um, also, if they, if students have not already creating their accounts for their platforms, we really don't want uh, freshmen and sophomores doing this because they may forget. Uh, but as a junior and senior, definitely. Um, and again, I recommend applying to your safety schools first. These are schools, if you know you're going to get in, go ahead and submit it. It's, and then that gives you a whole lot more time to work on those target and those reach schools. Um, and then to start reflecting and drafting a personal statement, again, it takes time. And so whenever I'm reading students' personal statements, you know, if it's really good, um, I'll tell them how many drafts has this been through? And they're like, man, like five or six. I'm like, I can tell because it's good. I don't, I really don't have any edits. And so that's really important too. So that's something they really do need to be doing at the end of the spring semester uh, in the summer, start working on those drafts. Uh, because it can be intense uh, trying to balance. Because again, there, even though colleges, well, actually I take that back. Um, colleges may not necessarily see their senior year right now. I'll say that but they still have to focus on performing well academically their senior year and then trying to figure out, you know, what college they're going to go to, you know, after they graduate. So, and also with that being said, I will say that some of these schools will require something that's called a mid-year report. And so what a mid-year report is, is, you know, for example, if a student got into, um, we'll say Boston, for example, but the school's like, hey, we want your mid-year report. They want to see how you're doing that senior year. So they're going to see 9th, 10th, 11th grade and that first semester of 12th grade year. I mean, in the past, there have been some students who like, you know what, I already got into my school, like I'm good. They stop, you know, they don't do well their senior year and schools can revoke that decision and it has happened. So just encouraging students, you know, although you got into your school, just continue to do well. Um, and then we'll go to the next. Oh, so school links. Um, and I, I was going to actually say, because we are tight on time yes. and I want to honor people's time as best as possible, even if we go a couple minutes over, if you don't mind, let's focus on the school links next. And then the remaining slides that you have, I think that are timeline and sort of suggestions yeah. of what to do what year. I think those are things that largely people can metabolize on their own and then for our next meeting or in between if anyone wants to email uh, Ms. Galloway or our committee, um, you know, we can keep the dialogue going, but would that be okay with you? Fine, man, the time goes by really fast. It really does. And I feel like you're, you're awesome and you are full of information. And I feel like we're like a fire hose in someone, in all of these parents' faces probably of information, but I know there's been some talk in the chat and some private messaging. People are definitely curious about school links and whether their kids have been given access to it or not. And sort of, so if you don't mind taking it away on that topic, let's, okay. um, let's sort of have that be our closing yeah, so Idea. school links, and I think students have been getting confused because it's new. So school links is replacing Naviance. Um, students, students are like, so am I applying to my colleges in school links? And no, all school links does is it kind of serves as the in between, right? So when students submit their college applications to Common App, they still the colleges still need documents. So they need transcripts, they need teacher recommendations, they need a counselor recommendation, and so all of that information is done and sent to the colleges through school links. School links is an extension of parchment 
which if you don't know, that's how most schools will require transcripts to be sent. Um, but um, if we have time, if I can share my screen and just show you guys what School Links looks like. Um, as all students do have access to School Links, all they have to do is go to Canvas, Digital Resources, and they can log into School Links via Clever. So all students um, should have access to School Links. And so let me pull up. Will you say that slowly again? So Canvas. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, Canvas. Okay. And then digital resources. And then um, school links should be um, in there. I'm going to share my screen. And so it does look a little different this year. I know previously you guys could ask the counselors for the code, but you kind of have to go through your student now. And um, they're changing things on Schoolings daily to make it more um, accessible to us. Since it's such a new platform, we, we talk to the Schoolings people all the time. But um, yes, it is a little different this year. I personally like Schoolings a little better than Naviance. It's a bit more modern, um, which I appreciate. OK, I'm going to share my screen. Oh, do we need, I need to change you, I think, to, oh, no, yeah, I think we're good. Okay. Sharing my screen. Okay. So when you guys uh, go to School Links, it'll look like this for y'all. Um, when you guys, you guys can create, it's different from Naviance in that, like, you guys couldn't just create an account. You had to, like, have, like, a code. But if you guys scroll down here, um, you could sign up as a guardian. You could use your email address and stuff like that. I'm going to log in to show you guys what it looks like on the student end. Um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it from the perspective of a senior because each grade level has certain access and permissions uh, based on what's available. So I will show you guys what it looks like as a senior. And then I'll show you guys how you can get access, how you can get that access code from your student. Okay, so when your student logs in, this is what they will see. So um, students, we're kind of, I don't want to say we're done with college visits, but college visits have kind of like dwindled a bit. It's not as busy anymore. But um, the cool thing is that colleges, if they want to come to Carnegie, all they have to do is just go into School Links and register. And so if you guys would like an idea of the kind of colleges that are going to be coming to Carnegie, all students have to do is click on school events. And then they will be listed here. Like I said, they're kind of dwindling now. So we have one coming up. It's the California Institute of Arts. But we had a lot um, over the past like month or so. But this is where they would see that. Um, I'm going to jump straight into the colleges stuff. If you have a ninth, 10th, or 11th grader, this college application piece is going to be locked for them because they don't have access to it. They don't really have a use for it right now. But I just want to show you guys kind of like what the seniors will be doing. And so this is where the seniors will be adding stuff in. I'm gonna add a couple colleges um, just so you guys can see what they'll be doing. Um, Common App is integrated with School Links. And so they sync. And so if a student already has a Common App account, they've already been working on their college apps in Common App, all they have to do is click here where it says log in. They log in, they match their accounts, and then everything will automatically populate here. So if a student is applying to like 12 schools through Common App, once they link the accounts, all the schools will automatically pop up here. Um, if the school is using a platform other than um, Common App, um, if they're using like Apply Texas, or maybe they apply to the school directly on their website, they would have to go here where it says Add Application. And I'll show y'all what that looks like. Um, also, students have to do the FERPA waiver. 
all the FERPA waiver is, is, is the students giving the counselors permission to send their documents over to the colleges. And so we encourage students to waive their rights. If they don't waive their rights, they're kind of letting the colleges know like, hey, like I want to see everything that's being said about me, recommendations and stuff like that. That doesn't necessarily like look the best. Also, when you don't waive your rights, even if we send documents to a college, they may not necessarily take them. So we do encourage students to waive their rights and to sign it and stuff like that. Um, I'm going to add a college kind of like, you know, just for the fun of it. So let's say, for example, I add Rice. And so we're going to use Common App. Uh, we're going to save the app. And so um, in schooling, students can also request letters of recommendation from their teachers. It'll be here where it says teacher evaluations. And so if you click here where it says add recommender, uh, we'll, for example, we'll do Mr. Parker. So it's really important that students, of course, there's a ton of Parkers. So it's really important that they know what Mr. Parker's um, name is. And then here they can put the subject. Um, even though it's optional, we do want them to put like, you know, good afternoon. Thank you for agreeing to write a letter of recommendation. Ms. Casperson does a really great presentation on etiquette. So how you should approach your teachers with a letter of recommendation. Also, it's really important that students kind of start crafting a resume. I'll go into that really quickly because in order for teachers, you know, to write the letter of recommendation, it would be nice to see everything that they've done. And then uh, once they submit the request, it'll go to their email and that's how they can get it done. Um, going back to counselor documents, um, students are responsible for these first two columns here. This third column is the documents that the school is requesting that the students need to send. So the school report is essentially, um, it's their uh, transcript, sorry. The transcript is a school report. The counselor recommendation is where the counselor will write a recommendation about the student. And again, the mid-year report that typically doesn't get sent until like the end of February, but that's essentially a mid-year transcript. So ninth, 10th, 11th grade in the first semester of their senior year. Um, and so this is what school links is. And so we tell students, you know, we can't send your documents if the schools aren't loaded in here. So it's really important that they put their schools in here. Um, one thing that ninth, 10th, and 11th graders could do, and actually here, let me exit out of here. One thing that they can start doing is they can start kind of document documenting all of the extracurriculars that they're involved in. And I'll show you guys what that looks like because it spits out a pretty neat and organized resume that I, I really like. I like it a lot better than Naviance because that resume was not, it just didn't look visually um, appealing. So I'll show you what it looks like here. Um, so the 9th, 10th, 11th graders, they can do college research in this platform too. So they can look at colleges. We ask them to heart them and stuff like that. I'm going to do the resume part right here. So if they click on careers, my profile slash resume. I also um, recorded videos for the seniors, pretty much what I'm doing with you guys. I recorded a demo. So if you guys would like that, I can send that to y'all if I'm going through this kind of um, fast. That would but, be great. That, I think that would, we'd really appreciate that if we could, if you, you said you already recorded it. Yes, I recorded yes. that for the seniors. We're working on the junior one, um, but I, I, I'll i get that to you guys for sure, absolutely. Cause I know they're kind of like, what is schooling? So I don't know what that is. Um, if the students scroll down here to experience, these are a few examples that are in here, but as 9th, 10th, 11th, they can start documenting things that they're already doing. So I know oftentimes there are parents who might reach out to me and say like, hey, like we have this intern, we're looking for a couple of students. Can you send it out and stuff like that? So if they're doing anything like that, they can start adding that stuff in here. And so I'm going to show you guys what the resume actually looks like. If they come up here to where it says resume, and then this is just some kind of like information, they can save it to their Google Drive or they can export it. And it'll notify them when it's ready. So it is ready here. This is pretty great. I mean, just even having a glimpse of what it can do, I think part of what we need to do as parents is jump on there and play around with it and get our kiddo to. Can you guys see this Word document? Do that with us. Oh, I can't see the Word doc. No, oh, I don't okay. know. I think I have to. Here it is right here. Okay, so when the um, resume is exported, this is what it looks like. Of course, this is just an example, but it's pretty like, you know, formal, I would think. Um, I usually tell students, you know, 
depending on who you ask, I know like all of that color and graphics and stuff. So most colleges don't really care for that, but something that's kind of like, you know, very neat like this and it, it exports it for them. So if you have some underclassmen who have already started doing things, I would encourage them to go ahead and start documenting it and then it'll export for them. So if they're already, you know, doing things, it's kind of like already here and the work's done for them. Um, another thing that they can do, and this will be um, the last thing that I kind of talk about, but um, let's see, let me go, oh, it's right here. Um, another thing that they can do is they can do, again, they can do research. So as you can see, this is for a ninth grader, this stuff is blocked out for them, um, but they can do school search, right? So we usually tell students the, the best, I guess the most up-to-date is the actual website. So we do tell them to actually go to the website. But for example, let's say they're interested in UT Austin. Um, they can click on it and there we go. And so it just kind of tells them general information. Again, we highly encourage them to go directly to the website. But uh, we also, I know Ms. Chapman really likes for her alpha split to actually like favorite the school. And so that lets us know, like, for example, um, for seniors, there was this one opportunity with Vanderbilt. And so, but this, uh, the counselors had to nominate students. And so she was really only accepting students who actually had the school in their list and it was favorited. So students can start doing that. If they're like wanting to build their college list, they can create a list here. And so like, let's say for example, they like, I don't know, potential or safety schools, they can do that. So it really is kind of like a college research platform. They can add it there. Uh, but again, we do highly encourage them to actually um, go onto the website to do a lot of that. There's also some assessments in here too. Um, there's, oh, the game, I won't go into it, but the game of life is really cool. Um, if they kind of want a good idea of what it's like to be an adult like the rest of us, <laughs> they can do the game of life. It was actually really neat. But um, I'm going to show you guys how to get your access code. So once your student is logged into School Links, if they go up here where to this little gear where it says more settings and they go to account settings, they go here to your guardians. They can either, so they can copy this and they can send it to you, but it's not going to actually show the code because this is a demo account but this is where they could claim the code. I'm going to do a little bit of research because I know with Naviance, we were able to send codes. I don't think we can do that this year, but I will look into it um, because I think sometimes that might be a little easier to send it to you guys instead of trying to get your students to log in and stuff like that. So I'll keep you posted. Communicating with our teenagers? You said what? <laughs> what are you asking us to do? <laughs> yeah, I know. I know they can do they can be a little sassy, I already know. So <laughs> so I'm gonna look into that. I feel like there's a report or something that can give us codes, but I'm not entirely too sure. But if you guys would like to kind of like start doing the process yourself, this is where you would go um, to do it. But I think that's everything with school links. I'm sorry we kind of have to like rush through it, but you know, that's kind of like the gist of it. Um, for I think that's Fabulous, because we're going to have a lot of information every time, but I don't think any night will be as chock full of just like brass tacks information as this one. And we have time now because you've introduced people to these different topics of, you know, summer things that you can do in the summer and financial aid and the applicant early decision, all these kinds of things. Now we can drill down and unpack some things, I think. Um, moving forward. So I hope um, people will join us and spread the word and that we have been recording this um, evening. So it will be posted. Um, I, it may take a couple days because um, we're all volunteers. But um, I, I realize at the beginning, I think we've lost a lot of people, but I don't even think I introduced myself with my name. So my name is Danielle Bachelor, and I have a junior boy named Colson Bachelor. Um, who started at Carnegie when he was a freshman. Um, so that's sort of um, my affiliation with Carnegie Vanguard High School. And um, again, it is college.readiness at cvhspto.org. Um, I was planning to take a few questions, but I solicited uh, 
that in the chat and it doesn't seem like anyone has followed on with another question. So I think in um, deference to the time, we'll just close the, close the Zoom room and please reach out if you have questions. Gari. Uh, actually, oh, really, Gari, raise your hand, yeah. No, well, it's probably just the same thing. Um, Mary has had her hand up um, for a while. I don't know if um, her question was Oh, answered. you know what, to be honest we, with you, that just shows how much of an old fart I am because I thought she was doing a high five this whole time. Sorry, Mary, you've had okay, that. Okay, so, so Mary, do you want to unmute? Really sorry about that. The way it like showed up in the chat, it was in the chat, also it looked like um, okay. it was an emoji. But... All right. And maybe their, their question got answered. Um, Are there any other um, questions? Ms. Galloway has been very generous with her time both last yeah. year and um, this year. So like Daniel said, there, there, there are other opportunities. I'm getting mostly in the chat. This was informative and thank you. And I know uh, Ms. Galloway and, and I definitely have a few things that we're going to go back and follow up with people on. So I think, um, Gari, did you have something you wanted to say? You're going to highlight Mary's raised hand, her, her emoji hand that I, <laughs> um, so I guess we will see you November 16th if not sooner, there's a few things that are floating out there. And if they come together before that, we'll spread the word as fast as we can. But November 16th, same place, same time. Yay. Thank, Thank you, you. Be well. Thank you. Thank you.